Because of you, Canada was uh, ranked the number one region of North America last year. We've grown the business 36%. And I don't see any slowdown in our business considering the fact that we had a Q1 at 33% and going to be even bigger in Q2. So thanks for your business. It's very fascinating as well because some of the region uh, in North America are much bigger than we are. And when we look at our pipeline of opportunity and value and quantities, open shift is bigger than some of the region are three times our size. Same thing with Ansible, their opportunity we have are three times larger than what we have in, in some of the largest region like Northeast or Central or West Coast. So thanks for that because without you, these things don't happen. Canada has a bit of a reputation that we're always behind in adopting technology, but I think Red Hat solution over the last few years, we're, we're changing that trend where I believe the region in Canada is adopting our technology as fast if not faster than the US marketplace, which is really a first time a IT company can say that in front of a crowd like this. Um, it's quite, quite interesting. Um, we, we made some key announcements at Summit, two in particular that I'd like just to briefly touch on. IBM, really uh, we enhance our, our, our partnership with IBM. Now IBM will go to market with OpenShift. They will, they will put their, their apps on, on container, Red Hat container managed by OpenShift. So if you have a, an install base of IBM application and you're interested in OpenShift, this announcement makes this world very much different for you. So uh, please go read on that if you want, and we're going to talk briefly about that today as well. Same thing with Microsoft. We enhance our relationship by also you'll be able in Azure to use OpenShift, bring your workload into, into a container model where Microsoft now can, can remarket uh, OpenShift and make it much easier for you to move workload and move uh, these applications on, on the cloud with Microsoft. Also, another point I'd like to make based on Summit, we had... On Summit, we had sent to our customer that attended Summit, we had about 200 people from Canada, which was the largest uh, attendance, attending uh, uh, Summit from, uh, at, uh, to San Francisco last year, and with, which also included about 25 executives attending our executive briefing, which was fantastic. So we have a long list of reference accounts that were speaking in different workshop on the stage in some cases. So I'd just like to mention some of the customer. If you ever want to go take a look what the Canadian customer are doing, these are public reference. You can go on our website, look at Summit, uh, the details of what's going on. We had Mega Montreal, RBC, Rogers, Bell, TELUS. Uh, we had the BC government, University of Laval, and they had a few other names I mentioned because these have different use cases that you may want to take a look at. UPS, Walmart, Duke Health, and, and Cisco. I'm just mentioning a few, but we had a list of about 50 that was sent out to our customer that attended just kind of a, in the material that we presented in some of those uh, breakout sessions. So if you feel like uh, going reading them, go for it. Some of the, one of the common thread of these references, a lot of it is OpenShift, middleware product, and Ansible. So you can see what they are doing with uh, these products, what they're trying to do to improve their, their environment. We have a l huge agenda loaded with all kind of good stuff today. We're going to have a breakout session just before lunch. The, um, the, uh, there was a group that are interested in the, uh, in the infrastructure will stay here, and there's a group that will go to the next room, a Queensky room. So look at the agenda that you have on your table. Pick the session that you will have before lunch and after lunch. These two sessions, you have a choice to go stay here or go over there. And uh, that's kind of what, uh, what it's all about uh, for, for today. Uh, a full, uh, we also have a guest speaker. Uh, every speaker today are from Canada, which I'm really proud to say that we have so much talent in Canada. We, we do our own, own big show like this. But we have one lady that uh, had dinner with last night, uh, Lucy Kerner. She's our security expert, and she's going to be closing the meeting today with a, 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 her thought process, and she's a strategist on security. So she's going to come and talk to you about security. There's a lot of questions in our customer base about uh, container security, open shift, where we make sure it's all secured. So feel free to, uh, to obviously attend the session until the end, and she'll, she'll be here at the networking session also for, for a Q&A after, after for if you have any specific question for her. She's, uh, she's been with Red Hat for a while, long time. Um, uh, this one, whoops. 
Yeah, we have, um, Intel is a great partner, a great sponsor of Red Hat. We do a lot of events with, Red, with, with, with Intel. And uh, working together, both upstream and downstream, to integrate uh, and support each other technology, deliver stable, secure, and unified solution that span every IT environment. Based on Red Hat Open Software Stack, Red Hat uh, Linux, uh, OpenStack, Ansible, and Storage. So Red Hat and Intel have a lot of collaboration together to make sure that this is fully uh, baked and ready to go when you guys implement this solution into the, the new, the new chipset, chipsets. Um, well, obviously, we, we have built a huge amount of expertise over the year between the open source and what we deliver to the customer. There's a bunch of partners in, in between. And we, we do a pretty good job at Red Hat to integrate and make sure we have certification in place for all of those partners that comes and play into, into, into the, your environment. And it gets very complex at times. But today I'd like to highlight a few of the partners in the room that are around the table, around also in the corridor where you're going to have a chance to sit down with them and see what they offer to the marketplace. Obviously, key partner, Intel, Hyvel, Arctic, Optica, Mobia, and Tidal Migration. Great partners that have grown a lot with Red Hat for the last few years. So good, good round of applause for them. We are also asked to talk about our training. You guys are here because you want to learn something new and you're probably going to look to implement something new that you haven't touched before or just starting to, to play into, into the different solution that we have. And we have an offering today until August 31st. So if you want to buy a training subscription, we're going to give you a 25% discount until that. So because there's a lot of a, a knowledge transfer, there's a lot of skill set gap between our technology and what you have today in your organization. So we have a table outside, and the table is there for you. If you want to go, uh, you're interested, your company is interested, sign up for some s training subscription and have unlimited training for a long period of time, and it's quite valuable. And for you, we can go. You know, we also have some certification tests attached to this, so it's a good package. It's very cost-effective, and we sell lo a lot of those in, in the marketplace. Uh, a few housekeeping area where... Um, we're going to have a survey like we usually do. Please uh, fill up the form along the way, different speakers, and drop it at the end of the day. We're going to have a small, small gift of appreciation for you to, uh, to come. Um, I'd like also to promote, we're going to have a, a, a trailer, a big van going from coast to coast in, uh, in September in Canada. And we're defining some cities across Canada where the van will be parked. And we'll have, you'll see live some of the Red Hat solution and we'll have some an ability for you to go and touch the technology and see what we do. I know we're going to have a location downtown. We're looking for a location in Brampton, looking in location for potentially Kitchener-Waterloo. We want a van to circulate in Toronto, a few places, to make it easy for you to go and see what, what we have from a technology perspective, be able to touch and feel the technology and meet some of the people that are, have a great use case that uh, can share that information with you. So it's the first time we do this. Uh, it's going to start at Seattle. It's going to go to Vancouver. It's going to go all throughout Canada and Toronto will be uh, September uh, 10, 11 to 15. So if you have colleagues outside of Canada, outside of Toronto, you feel will be interested, uh, we'll, we'll, we have the dates on our website for you to map that out and get them to go and visit Red Hat's uh, big trailer. Uh, the biggest issue is how to feed people when it's only a van and park in the parking lot and how you f figure out the bathrooms, and, but uh, we're, we're, we're on it. Um, the, uh, this morning we have, um, our, our first presenter is going to be Paul Armstrong. Paul, Paul has been with Red Hat for several years. He's a very, very strong solution architect for Red Hat. And uh, Paul is going to talk to us about... Um, what are you going to talk to us about, Paul? These, these, fo these footprints are so small, I have a hard time to reading it. Uh, anyway, Paul, come over. I know, I know it's quite interesting. The agenda is on the, on the table. Hey, Paul. I'm Paul Armstrong. I'm a Principal Solution Architect with Red Hat Canada. Uh, I've been with the organization uh, going on six years now. Uh, today, uh, we're going to do a, a two-part presentation. Uh, I'll do a, a portion of uh, the journey to digital transformation uh, where we talk about some of the challenges and successes of migrating to the cloud. Um, we talk about open source innovation, uh, and we look at the importance of the ecosystem. Uh, after uh, my presentation, Michael Cardi will come up, our chief strategist, uh, and discuss a little bit more on 
the opposite side. Instead of focusing on technology and, and what's going on, it's, it's all the process and discovery culture that goes behind it. So let's get started. So what a, what a difference a year makes, not only from the attendees at this conference going from 300 to 400, uh, but the number of uh, examples of how we're looking at moving to cloud. Hmm. April 2017, Forbes, uh, in their uh, discussion of the state of cloud adoption, said 80% of all IT budgets in the next 15 months will be targeted at cloud or committed to cloud. Uh, it's, I'm pretty sure it's you know, 18 months or 15 months from April 2017. How many people have 80% of their budget committed to cloud? Not quite, right? Uh, there might be some, you know, but uh, not 80% of all IT budgets. Now, I think what they probably meant to say was 80% of all IT budgets will have a portion of that budget committed to cloud. Now, I think that's something that all of us in this room can agree. In fact, I would probably uh, argue that this. 100% of Canadian uh, companies will be increasing their spend on cloud this year. Everybody is moving to cloud. Everybody is using cloud technologies within uh, their uh, organization. They may not know it, but they are, right? Developers are moving quickly to adopt technologies that will allow them to move much more quickly. But that becomes a challenge for our organizations. What cloud are we going to start using? Why are we moving to cloud? So I'm gonna try a little bit of an informal survey here. Uh, I'm gonna uh, go through each of these questions. I'm gonna ask you to put up your hands. I'm gonna try and get um, uh, someone, Vlado, to write down the numbers uh, as, as we go through. So how many people are in the room feel that their companies are moving to a cloud, and notice I mean any kind of cloud, I don't care what cloud model it is, I don't care what type it is, I don't care what kind of implementation you're doing, whether it's uh, with OpenStack or you're using uh, other technologies. So how many believe it's for uh, speed and ease of delivery of software? Hands up, come on. Okay, let's call that 35%, okay? How many feel that it's easy access to new technology? Hands. Wow. That's 10, 15%. How about cost reduction? Whether it's startup cost reduction or it's cost reduction with your infrastructure. Hands up. Okay, really call it 20%. Wow, these are, these are interesting numbers. How about increased reach? I'm trying to use the cloud to get to more customers or to get to more regions where I don't have a presence? Five. Okay. Other. <laughs> All hands should go up. What's, ask the last question. So some bold person here, if you don't have, if you don't see it on the screen, why are you moving to cloud? Stand up, shout it out. Everybody's moving there? Well, we're going because we're following the crowd. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I say that's a great joke. Thanks, thanks for the segue. Uh, but you know what? I, there's, there's a lot of different reasons why people are moving to cloud. And what I'm trying to get a gauge of is where people might want to move to in the various breakout sessions. Because we'll address these different topics and the breakout sessions and try and help you understand what the uh, consequences are, what the tools are, what the techniques are to moving uh, from one way or the other, depending on what your goals are, okay? How you wanna, why you're going to the cloud. And is the road to the cloud easy? Or do we want it to be easy? Does it look like the potholed road in the woods? Or does it look like the super highway with the uh, speeding cars? Well, you know what? I think it really depends. 
So where, where are we, how are we approaching it? Where are we coming from? So our journey to the cloud really depends on where we started and where we are going, what our destination is. So what are the goals that we're trying to get out of moving to the cloud? So that'll make all the determination of, of how we want to do that. Where do we start? Am I going to be using a, a, a private cloud on-prem and strictly on-prem? Am I going to use a public cloud? Uh, take one of the large uh, IaaS providers like Google or Amazon or Azure. They all are now building data centers in Canada and can offer us that ability to move. And we don't have to worry about data sovereignty issues with them. Or maybe, depending on where their storage and their, micro, their storage uh, replication tends to be. But we can have some control over that, but it still becomes that, that determination. Where am I going to go? How am I going to do it? Now we're starting to talk about multi-clouds because, well, I may have to provide services in multiple regions. Do all cloud providers have a data center in all regions that I need to serve? We've got some, some people here that I know are, uh, belong to global companies, uh, companies that have uh, to span the breadth of the world. So now I have to look at what clouds are available in each of my different markets. And then what am I going to do with those? And then how am I going to manage or what, how am I going to deploy on those clouds? Am I going to, actually we have cloud companies that are offering bare metal today in the cloud. And that's for primarily those people that need bare metal type uh, capabilities for performance reasons or what have you, or even for those customers that are just looking for a better form of hosting. Okay? But the classic implementation is, uh, is instances, right? using instances on our, our, our cloud platforms. The one that tends to be the, the most uh, aggressively pursued model today is deployment on containers because containers tend to solve many problems around software delivery because we're wrapping up those dependencies. And it makes it easier for our developers to, uh, to manage. But what choices are we going to make around those sorts of uh, uh, solutions? And, and where am I starting from? Am I starting from bare metal? Am I starting from a virtual machine? And how am I going to move those to, to the cloud? And then what sorts of technologies am I going to use and what uh, sorts of development methods are going to take place. Am I going to start with you know, uh, cloud native services and build my cloud native applications uh, straight out of the gate? Am I going to migrate and how do I migrate? Am I dealing with microservices? Do I, do I want to go with a microservice approach? Can I go with a microservice approach? Okay. All the rage today, functions, serverless, you hear that all over um, the, the uh, interweb and all of the uh, different uh, internet properties that just start talking about DevOps, et cetera. Well, what is, what is function-based computing? What is serverless computing? Am I going to use that? Does it make sense? Why would I want to use that? And then what sorts of tools, processes, what sorts of integrations am I going to have to make? Uh, what am I going to choose as my platform? Do I need something that is actually a pass? Where I have software developers working on that, or is it more containers as a service because I am getting my containers built by someone else? So all of these things, the journey, whether it's potholes um, or a super highway, really depends on where I'm starting and where I'm going, what technology I'm going to use. But in the end, I think we all really believe that the goal is to deliver innovation faster. We need to be able to react quicker to our marketplace, react quicker to our customers, deliver solutions and deliver uh, applications that give service to the end customer as quickly as possible. So that kind of makes us kind of scratch our head and say, well, how are we going to go from an isolated experiment that works well in the lab that a number of uh, infrastructure guys and developer guys uh, started working with, and how I'm going to turn that into a mass operation for uh, delivering innovation, and I'm modernizing 
my IT organization in the process. Decisions. Decisions, decisions. So, what cloud types will I use? Now when I start making those decisions and we start peeling back the onion on private cloud, hybrid cloud, uh, public cloud, and multi-cloud, I need to start looking at all the tools and technologies that I use in my data center today to run that operation, and I need to start looking at how they apply across this diverse set of infrastructures. How am I going to manage this? I, I'm, I'm starting to deal with my own private cloud and multiple clouds that I'm uh, deploying uh, infrastructure on, deploying applications on across the globe. How do I get information back? What's my telemetry? What am I using? Can it be the same? Do I have consistency across all of these clouds? Right? How am I going to get the metrics that I need to make the appropriate decisions? Do I have the skill sets in-house to be able to do this? Do I have the skill set across my uh, global organization that uh, can manage this? How do I ramp that up if I don't? There's more work than, uh, than anything else in this. Remember that moving to cloud isn't going to make things simpler. It is going to make things more complex. And we need to be intelligent about how we approach that so that we can manage that complexity and then make it simple, right? One of the powers we'll talk about today is, is automation. What sorts of workloads am I going to put in the cloud? Do I need to worry about that? Is it around uh, uh, the control that I have? Is it around security? How am I going to approach, uh, approach that? If I, once I start using a public cloud, I have to worry about my ingress of that application. How am I going to onboard that application to the cloud? If it doesn't work, or if I'm not satisfied, or I need to move to another cloud, how am I going to manage the egress and cost? I said 100% of Canadian companies are going to increase their spend on cloud this year. There's been some very notable situations where the cost of moving to cloud has been very let's say, uh, surprising for some because of control, right? Looking at how I manage that onboarding. How am I going uh, to mix these all together? Am I going to use that as a bursting strategy? Okay. And what platforms will I use? Am I going to go straight IaaS, where then I, I, I use a, uh, an infrastructure that's provided for me, and then I build my own uh, tools on top of it? Am I going to start using a PaaS internally? Lots of people are moving towards PaaS type technology. You take a look at the adoption of uh, container orchestration platforms within uh, the, uh, the industry. It's probably the fastest moving um, type of adoption outside of automation. And then as we start going and looking at where we move, so how do I manage things like the images that get used? Whether they're uh, instant images or they're container images, how do I go about the managing uh, of those? How do I manage the uh, configuration? If I'm going across multiple cr clouds, how do I manage consistency? How do I measure compliance? All of these become decisions. There are tools out there. We need to understand what the tools are what the capabilities are, what we need, and ensure that we uh, do our due diligence in, in bringing them into our deployments. And it could be maybe I'm actually offering a service. I'm building a service within my organization, whether it's a, a, a SaaS offering, or I'm at actually offering PaaS as a service to the organizations within uh, my business. Okay. All of these things require us to make decisions, and cloud models, uh, app models to use. Am I using microservices? Am I creating uh, APIs? How am I encapsulating my legacy platform? Uh, am I using, uh, I, am I going to a microservice model? Am I going to build microservices? Or am I going, going to try and adapt that um, uh, DevOps model 
because I need to work with a monolith. And a fast moving monolith is one of those patterns, right? How am I gonna deal with the uh, integration? How am I gonna deal with how I manage as I build out those microservices, how do I manage the input into that, uh, into that legacy app or that monolith? These are all decisions that we have to make. We have to think about, uh, and it seems hugely complicated. And there have been notable failures, but there have been a lot of successes. And we've, we've witnessed them uh, at Red Hat. We've been a part of, uh, of those successes. And I'm gonna go through a few of them here for you today. And they're quite large scale. So as an example, um, this, this one on, on the screen is from a, a, a Fortune 100 uh, FSI uh, out of the United States. Uh, you probably have one of their credit cards in your pocket. Um, their goal was to uh, help bring their products to marketplace much more quickly because guess what? The credit card industry is very, very competitive. It's very, very tough. Um, so what they did is they decided that they were going to manage this in a cloud model. They decided to pursue a cloud and they deployed an IaaS and PaaS environment. We worked with them to stand up that environment. We worked with them to help their developers understand the processes that they needed to go through and help them develop a CI-CD pipeline uh, or CI-CD pipeline uh, templating so that they could deliver those applications much more quickly. And they would go all the way from development through to production. We help them rewrite their key application uh, around their uh, promotions and their loyalty program. And we ported that from a mainframe architecture and virtual machines onto microservices running on the, uh, on the pass. We're able to help them achieve extreme reduction in the cost of delivering those applications. And moving from taking months and months to deliver a single feature to weeks in delivering a feature. And now they have a modernized application uh, development platform and delivery platform that helps them meet their needs and achieve that goal of being uh, more reactive to their marketplace. We work with another um, global financial services organization. Um, they have places in the city, <coughs> city group. Um, we worked with them and they are very, uh, very much uh, down the road around the technologies, but they're looking at their massively complex global environment and how to integrate the technologies into that. We worked with their engineering uh, products group uh, to uh, help develop a container platform and integrate that with their network uh, environment, their global network environment, their storage environment, dealing with their security infrastructure and all the complex processes that they need to manage around being a global financial services institution. Uh, we help them develop a targeted uh, application approach uh, with well-defined standards, or sorry, standards uh, and processes because one of the big challenges is how if I've got this large organization with all this modern, modernization that I need to go through, how do I streamline, streamline that and make that smooth for the organization, make it smooth for the teams? And we assisted uh, in, uh, with the distributed teams around the globe, uh, working with them and their outsourcing partner to actually go through the process and help them move workloads from their existing environment to their cloud environment. But you know what? I'm gonna be honest, I'll take a, take a little bit of an aside here. As for Red Hat, that doesn't scale, right? We can't do that for everyone. And we actually, we didn't do it with this organization either. Our goal isn't to uh, do uh, a five year, um, 10 year residency with a company and move them uh, off uh, their existing technology onto a cloud technology. We're, we're there, we're teaching people to fish, okay? Well, that's, that's kind of the driver that, that we go through. We want to train you so that you can build that center of excellence. And that's exactly what we did with this customer as well, 
is we took the learning that we provided to the uh, initial teams that uh, were on the projects delivering this new technology, and we trained them to be mentors for their uh, others. So they were able to leverage that, tech, that uh, expertise from the uh, first uh, organization, uh, organizational change into further organizational change. <clears throat> we also worked with a very large uh, healthcare provider uh, in the United States, over 10,000 developers. Healthcare is very, very large in the US. What we needed to do is help them deliver that capability, build and test software faster so they could deliver it out to their um, healthcare setting. And we help them change that model. The goal is to change that operating model so that they can deliver those uh, features monthly or weekly into uh, a clinical setting. How we did that, we helped them adopt in their choice, again, was a container platform. Uh, like I said, container platforms tend to be uh, the, the most highly adopted model today, simply because we can deliver technology in very small bits. We can move very quickly. And today, they're now running 4,000 applications on that platform. Over 20 of those are considered mission critical or clinically critical to operating their business. We help them uh, build a scaffolding for their environment because they have many teams. Uh, and it's not just when I start rolling out uh, container platform technology or I'm, I'm, I'm rolling out a cloud within my environment. It's not never just one, it's always many. So we help them build something called push, we actually do it today, push button infrastructure. The ability to define what tools, what technologies, what platform, uh, what container platform, what uh, orchestration tools, et cetera, what you know, code management, uh, code, uh, code, um, uh, No, I lost it. Do you, it's there, there it is, right there on the floor. Um, no, uh, uh, code, uh, code quality checks and uh, code standardization. We help them uh, deliver uh, that technology, we're able to provide it where there's scripting in behind, the, behind the scenes where when they want to deliver that technology, they can make choices, allow people to select what they need specific to a project, and then deliver that rapidly and build a completely new infrastructure. We actually use that in our consulting practice today with a number of the uh, methodologies that we go through. We can deliver a new cloud platform in about 30 minutes on our own infrastructure. That's pretty impressive. So all of this success has led us to a number of conclusions. Uh, within uh, Red Hat, and, and some of these are, are not new. We're adopting uh, this out of uh, our open source community. And what we believe is that open source powers open innovation. And when we start looking at adopting cloud, the important thing is avoid the long-term strategy, avoid trying to figure it all out at the beginning, and just start. Start small. Plan enough that helps get you off the ground. Now, depending on the size of your project, that might be a little or a lot. But the, the, the key is to get moving. When we start looking at that project, break things down to very, very small uh, incremental chunks. But the chunks are also designed so that they're as independent as possible, so that we can reuse these, right? Uh, go through rapid feedback cycles, make sure that communication is high. We're using automation everywhere, not just in my infrastructure. I want to have it uh, in my testing. I want to have it in my software delivery. Automate everything. And build new skills. Start working with your partners uh, internally. Ensure that you're transferring that skill using mentorship uh, using uh, kind of a buddy system, if you will, to help expand that knowledge. And remember, mistakes or 
failures are only failures if you don't learn from them. Big failures are bad, little failures are an opportunity for us to do rapid course corrections to make sure projects don't drag, okay? But we don't do any of this alone. Red Hat's not the sole provider of these solutions. We depend absolutely on the open source community for innovation. When you take a look at the technology that you'll see today, as you go through our breakout sessions, you'll see a lot of this technology uh, as the uh, underpinnings of what Red Hat delivers. There are millions of projects in the internet, and what our goal is, is to help find through your input, which ones are the most important to the business. And then what Red Hat does is we foster those communities. And we bring those in and build those into our products. You'll see uh, a number of the, uh, the technologies here are actually quite new. Uh, CRIO uh, is a project in the last few years. This is looking at driving a standardization around container imaging. Red Hat, really, like, um, we don't care. You want to use Docker? Awesome, let's use Docker. You want to use Rocket? Sure, let's use Rocket. You want to use something else? Don't care. What we want is we want to try and get down to one standard, or a, a large enough standard that it makes no difference what your uh, container platform or your container format is, okay? In fact, today, uh, our technologies support multiple. But it's also uh, how we deal with all of that technology is it's an open source culture. And we believe that open source, open source culture should permeate every project. Dealing with collaboration, collaboration between not only our ops uh, and security and development teams and our business stakeholders, but also between uh, application teams to drive that reuse, uh, the, drive the discovery of, uh, of services. And the shared problems are always solved much more easily than if I sit in my own lab and try and figure them all out on my own. I'm not guilty of that. And working together, we can create the standards that we need uh, and having that transparency. And this is important for everyone in this room. Red Hat and our technology is completely transparent. If you need our source code, it's available for you to download. If you need a new feature in a product, you can open what's called an RFE, Request for Enhancement, uh, as a support case. Everybody's got that uh, ability. And you provide the business case, and you'll actually get feedback on your support case as to when that's going to occur, or if that's going to be to occur. I work on the background uh, a lot with these technologies, uh, and I see those go through every day. As you go through our, uh, um, go through any of the patches that we provide for our platforms for our technology, you'll see a lot of them are designed to achieve particular goals for certain organizations. And those are the organizations, they're big and small, that either have identified challenges, identified bugs, uh, or have uh, provided a very unique um, capability that we've enabled and pushed upstream. And that's a goal of our product development. How we go about it is through a complete immersion in the open source culture. Everything about Red Hat is open source. So we uh, believe, we go out, we will actually look at technology we will decide that that technology is right for you, and we'll go and we'll find the guys that, uh, that uh, are um, kind of the key people in that community, and we'll hire them. And then we'll set them free. Go back into the community, just go and develop. Develop that community. And we participate uh, in a, a very large number of communities. If you take a look at some of the technology today, uh, if you uh, look at uh, something like Kubernetes, we're the second largest contributor to Kubernetes next to Google. And when you look at all of the other contributions combined,
from everybody else behind Red Hat and Google, it doesn't add up to what uh, Google and Red Hat pro uh, uh, contribute to Kubernetes. So we're very, very active in those communities. And then what we do is we'll take those communities or we'll take those uh, technologies and we integrate them. We'll pull in the tools that are necessary for you to achieve your goals and we'll productize them. And we start with something upstream called a community where we integrate those projects, right? So Fedora, as an example. Fedora is the upstream project for Red Hat Open uh, uh, Enterprise Linux. And that's where all of that innovation occurs. And then what we do is we'll take stable releases, uh, or what we believe are the most stable releases, out of those communities. We'll pull those in, and we send those through a complete integrated uh, testing stack. And we go through uh, testing it from the operating system all the way through to the application, and we test it with other software. We test it with hardware. We actually have the largest hardware compatibility list in the world, bar none. And the second largest software compatibility list in the world, second only to Microsoft. Because we're driving to make sure that what Red Hat does is make open source consumable for the enterprise. We want to allow you to have that innovation, have that um, uh, modern technology, but you need to have it in a reliable, safe, and secure fashion. And the one thing that we do is that once it's open source, it's always open source. When we go out and we acquire companies, uh, the, the most recent was Ansible. Ansible was a uh, kind of traditional uh, open source company uh, where they had uh, part of their portfolio. Ansible, uh, the, the engine portion, was open source, right? 100% open source. Actually, couldn't really get support on it. Uh, and then Ansible Tower was a proprietary technology. You had to purchase a license, and you couldn't see the source code. Well, when Red Hat acquired Ansible, we did what we always do. We went through all of that technology, and we go looking for anything that we don't own the patents to, or that is proprietary technology, and we either bought the patents to protect you, or we substituted the technology with open source technology. And then we open source the whole thing. So now you have two communities for uh, automation. You've got uh, the AWX community, which is the upstream community for Ansible Tower. And you've got Ansible still. But we've also produced uh, um, subscription-based uh, enterprise models in Ansible Tower, and Red Hat Ansible Tower, and Red Hat Ansible Engine. So you can get full support on these technologies. That's kind of the role that we play and well, how we drive uh, through those technologies. But we still publish all of that final source code on our FTP site. And there's kind of the differentiation. And this is an, another one of the choices that we have to make as we start deploying our clouds. Are we going to use an upstream pro product or are we going to use a downstream product? How am I going to approach that within my infrastructure? There are advantages to both. And you know, everyone's got to make their own choices. And we respect that. If you need to move super fast, upstream is your choice. If you need to be at that bleeding edge, upstream is where you're going to see the technology come out first, that you're going to see the most advanced features, but you're also going to take the most risk. Right? Because, well, what happens if I decide to use an upstream component and there's a problem in it? Are they delivering patches? Not usually. Upstream communities typically run on a very rigid schedule. They're going to deploy a new major release every six months. Okay? And if there's a bug in a current release, that gets fixed in the next release. And to get the fix for that bug, I need to deploy the new version. Okay. For some people, because of the, the rate and the pace at which they're moving, that's not a problem. 
For other organizations, that becomes very difficult. Doing a new major, uh, major release upgrade of a particular technology every six months is very difficult. As you start moving downstream, now you're getting into longer life cycles of product. The product gets to be supported instead of for six months, it gets to be support, supported for years and years. And organizations like Red Hat, what we do is we provide that patching capability. And what we'll do is we understand that the organizations are delivering that technology uh, in um, uh, an enterprise environment and have a different set of control processes that they need to go through. They can't change a major version every six months, but they need to be secure. And that's where you see downstream playing its role. It's designed to deliver stable features and to stabilize existing features and manage and maintain that, that long runtime capability. And as you go further down the stack in an application, that tends to be more and more the case, right? So these are, again, choices that we need to make, what, what we're going to do upstream uh, or downstream. And this leads us to the thing as well, what happens? We, we don't solve every problem. We solve a lot of them, but we don't solve every problem. So we don't do it alone from a, a, a community perspective and how the software is built, but we don't do it from a solution perspective either. And that's where some of our partners today that are here, uh, Intel, Mobia, uh, Arctic, uh, our good friends at Tidal Migrations, uh, uh, good friends at uh, Highvale, all of these people come in to work with uh, you to help provide solutions. But there's also additional technology solutions. And the ecosystem around what you're building is incredibly important. When you look at the ecosystem uh, around Red Hat uh, and our technologies, you'll see that we've got partnerships and integrations with some of the most notable names in open source today. If you're looking at security, we'll hear more about this later today and uh, understanding where we're managing, uh, we're working with our partners to develop technologies around container scanning, okay? Where we're dealing with technologies around helping you manage code. There's one of my favorites isn't up there is, is our good friends at GitLab. Uh, Understanding the metrics. Remember, we were talking about metrics and telemetry and how we're managing our infrastructure. Sysdig is, uh, and New Relic and uh, other technologies are helping us uh, there. HashiCorp, how do I get my images up to the cloud? Right? What technology do I, I need to convert it from a VM to a particular target cloud platform? HashiCorp has got a great solution for that. We, uh, a number of our customers rely on them. How do we back things up? How do we integrate into the networks, right? Define a software-defined network. Well, we ship a software-defined network uh, capability with, with uh, our technology. But how, if I need advanced um, uh, solutions, uh, I have very complicated networking requirements, how do I uh, manage that? We've got uh, friends from Cisco, Nuage, uh, Juniper that, that help us with that. Okay. And all of the other technologies that you see here on the screen, these are things that we need to assist us in building out the whole solution. Red Hat doesn't uh, do it on its own. We have a very dynamic partner community. There's a number of sites you'll, I don't want to steal the thunder of some of the guys that are coming up after me, uh, but there are a number of sites that will be discussed through the breakout sessions where you'll be able to see where our integrations occur uh, between our uh, underlying technology uh, and a number of these partners. And so we're bringing it all together. And when we start looking at this, uh, we'll walk through uh, a little stack here in just a second about how we're going to uh, talk about this today and where we're gonna go. So we're gonna start that journey we're going to take a look at what it means to start building out a cloud solution. We can't go through all of it today, but what we are going to do is take some time to address some particular notions, some things that we need to look at today. 
Uh, the infrastructure track is in blue. Uh, the developer track is in red. On your uh, agenda, what you'll see is different breakout sessions that you can go to. There's an infra infrastructure track, which will be here in this room uh, later today, and a developer track that will be uh, in the room next door. What we're gonna take a, a look at today from an infrastructure perspective is how IT automation is helping us to uh, A, manage that infrastructure, uh, B, build out those clouds, and manage the configuration and the deployment of the technology that we might use, whether it's a private cloud or a public cloud. We'll also talk about building out that hybrid cloud infrastructure. Uh, what technologies do we put in place over and above our uh, underlying solutions to ensure that we can knit uh, a bare metal server in our data center in with an instance-based computing model on a private cloud. And then from a developer perspective, as we move our applications uh, into the cloud and we start building out microservices, we need um, levels of integration between uh, those technologies and our legacy technologies, we'll talk about agile integration frameworks and we'll have a session on that uh, in our developer track. And then we'll have another session on delivering cloud native applications. If I've got Greenfield uh, or I've got uh, a solution that I'm gonna completely migrate, how do I go about doing that? But we're not gonna just talk about the technology. We'll talk about some of the knowledge, some of the uh, culture, people and processes that we need to put in place in order to make this effective, in order to make this uh, whole notion move. And we'll have uh, words from uh, one of our customers uh, later this afternoon. We'll have a customer come up and talk about their journey. So you can have the real word from the trenches. Here's someone who did this. And we're gonna wrap it up uh, today at the very end talking about security. How do we secure this whole system? What aspects do we have to look at? What techniques, tools, and technologies can we use? That's it for me. I'm gonna ask that uh, uh, Luke come back up on stage. Thank you very much. I really hope that you enjoy your Red Hat Day. <laughs>